Hi everyone, welcome to the AWS Blogger. My name is John Meyer and today we're going to be talking about AWS Outpost Part 3, the final episode. Before we begin, don't forget to hit that like and click subscribe. <laughs> First, I'd like to introduce our guest today. He's known for his outstanding use of slide animation, one of the co-authors of the official study guide for AWS Certified Advanced Networking, Principal Developer Advocate for AWS Outpost, Matt Lewis. Matt? Hey, John. How's it going? Great. How are you? Yeah, pretty good. You know, working away. Lots going on. So glad to be here chatting with you today. Yeah, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, you sitting down with us and talking about AWS Outposts. I, as you know, Matt is a huge networking guru here. Uh, I have a couple more questions, but I got to throw this out there. You know, he did, you know, obviously write, uh, co write, co author with this one for the networking. So uh, he knows what he's talking about. Um, and uh, there's I was no gonna... Outpost stuff in that one yet. No, no, there it. isn't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There will be a new version that comes out, right? <laughs> I hope so. I need I, I need to get the band back together and we need to sit down and, and we need a uh, transit gateway in there. There's no transit gateway and uh, we need outposts networking in there as well. And um, what I'd like to do as well, um, there's some reference architectures in there. I'd like to grow that because I think one of the biggest cu questions I get from customers is who else has done this and how like how did they do it? Oh, and I gotcha. reference architectures are really how that kind of, that's where the rubber hits the road. Like, hey, here's a, this is what you can build. Like, here's all the Lego blocks, but this is the castle that you build, right? So I'd love to add more of that kind of stuff in there. That would be, that'd be really cool. That's actually a really good idea for any uh, study guides or stuff like that is, you know, here's the stuff that we think you can do. Here's the use cases that can be done. Here's what people have done for it. So that's really good. Uh, I like that. I, I'm going to hold you to that one for the next version. <laughs> okay, sounds good. <laughs> uh, so we've got a couple more minutes here. I want to ask uh, just at least two more questions or three more questions. A really important one that I, I think for it is now I have this outpost rack in my environment. Let's talk about failure or alerting on failure. And in, in an AWS data center, if hardware fails, it's replaced immediately. Nobody knows about it. Nobody hears about it externally because you've built your environment. Uh, you know, it's sustainable for that one. I've never heard of anybody having an issue in that. But now I have a physical uh, rack in my data center. If What happens if a hardware fails? Who's notified? How does that work? Yeah, no. So, I mean, as part of the outpost, I mean, it is a managed service. So we're we're managing and monitoring the hosts in the outpost itself. So um, we get notified and we'll notify you to say, hey, your host has failed and we'll ship one out uh, with a guy to, to install it. Now, there's a couple of things we're thinking about here as well um, in that um, right now it is AWS managed and we would have an AWS person come out and, and swap that host out. Um, and, and that's fine. We can actually do that. Um, what I'd like to see in the future is the ability for us to ship you a host and you can put it in the rack. So then you don't have to wait for an AWS person to be available. So um, there's also, uh, you know, there's some question marks around, okay, how long is it going to take to replace a host um, in the outpost? Now, um, it does depend because an outpost could be in various different parts of the world. And especially in times like today, it could be quite difficult for us to get someone to your site. Um, but what I will say is it's always a good idea to, to, kind of manage the um, the instances and the capacity of the outposts on how many instances you're deploying. And if you're deploying, you know, a full rack's worth of instances and you lose a host, you're not going to be able to move those EC2 instances to another host. Um, so it's always a good idea to, to have some spare hosts that are available so that you say, oh, we have had a host failure. It does happen. It's physical hardware. In our regions, things could fail, right? Um, but managing that from an EC2 instance perspective and saying, well, hold on a second, I actually want to move these EC2 instances to another host that hasn't failed whilst I wait for AWS to, to figure out and replace the actual failed hardware. So um, definitely some things to consider and some things you can do um, to try and mitigate uh, if that does happen. Um, I will talk about network failure as well, just briefly. So the outpost is designed to be an always-on service. Um, so 
with the network connectivity, we do need to have that network connectivity always connected back to the AWS region. Now, um, and so we've got, uh, oh yeah, the virtual, the virtual animation. Yeah, here. I'm going to pull up jump the around. virtual here uh, as I flick it around and uh, get my virtual back up. Here it is. And we'll, there we go. There we go. So as you can see, we've got the two networking devices here in the rack. So that's going to give you LAN redundancy. Now, connecting back to the region, you need to have WAN redundancy too. So that could be in the form of multiple internet providers, or it could be in the form of a redundant direct connect. And so you'd basically have two direct connects using uh, public virtual interfaces connected back to the AWS region. And then if one failed, you've still got that WAN connectivity. Now, what basically happens if the outpost is disconnected is... Um, EC2 instances, are after about four to six hours, you, you basically lose connectivity back to the region, and so your IAM credentials will expire. And so your EC2 instances will go into a state of unavailable. Um, if it's a five-minute outage, for example, your EC2 credentials are still available or still they haven't expired yet. Um, basically, we have a spooling mechanism in the outpost to say, hey, let's um, take our logs and all of that data and, and kind of cache it here on the outpost and if the connection comes back within a couple of minutes it's fine you know the outpost keeps functioning as per normal you can still reach the outpost via the lgw from on premises but during that smaller outage all of your aws connectivity your intra vpc traffic and that sort of thing would obviously not be working so um what we always say to uh, aws customers is, is if um you know being highly available is important Things like a direct connector are great. Using multiple direct connects are better. Um, using multiple providers is even better still. Multiple co-location facilities. And you know, there's this kind of, um, there's this rat hole you can go down in redundancy and, and building double redundancy and more redundancy on redundancy. Um, but the outpost is dependent on that WAN connection. So it's not like we can put a, an outpost on a cruise ship and, and send it up to Alaska and, and plug it in when it gets back. Um, we have had that question from customers though believe it or not <laughs> yeah uh, actually that's very interesting uh you know shipping it on the cruise ship would be very uh unique uh use case for there but i brought up the architecture again because if you look at the yellow lines at the top here to aws public network and that's really what you're talking about uh the redundancy there of two direct connects uh you know or uh, to connect uh, network connections to internet connections out to an AWS region, correct or? That, that that's right. So the the yellow v, uh, VLAN that you see here is what we call the service link VLAN, and so it's actually um, two point to point VLANs from the customer device to the outpost device, but it's the same segment or this yellow service link segment, yep. and that is where you'll connect back to the AWS region. So what you'll basically probably want to do is say you've got two customer devices here they might connect to two um, CPE devices or customer premise edge devices. And those CPE devices might have a direct connect each. So then you've effectively got two different legs. And so if one direct connect fails, you've got the other connection down through the other leg down through to the outpost. Um, you could use two internet connections with two different providers if you wanted to as well, um, totally okay. Um, customers do also put firewalls in between um, the outpost and the AWS region. Um, with As far as firewalls are concerned, a redundancy is good as well, so you could have multiple firewalls. But we do ask that outbound communication is a, allowed from the Outpost Service Link subnet, which is uh, what we see here, the 10.5.0.0 slash 26. And so the Outpost will always initiate communications back to the region from that range, and it will then traverse over your customer devices and over the dual WAN connections, if you've got two WAN connections, and into the AWS region to the public realm and build or establish a set of tunnels from the outpost to the outpost service link anchor, which is in the region, which is what we were talking about earlier, tied to the availability zone. So let me ask you a question. If I lose that connectivity or I lose that link, I don't have my redundancy and I have my path to my local network, does that still work? Am I still able to access my EC2 instances or my data as long as my credentials are still available and haven't expired? Yes. So there's a couple of different caveats, though. So um, when we think about ECS and EKS, so you're running, uh, you know, EK EKS and, and Kubernetes on, on the outpost, the worker nodes are on the outpost. But the master node for EKS right now is actually in the region. So um, 
again, I don't know a whole bunch about Kubernetes but or EKS, but um, you would lose access to the master node in that case. So I'm not sure what kind of tolerance uh, EKS has around that. Same thing with ECS. Um, same thing with Route 53, or if you're using a private hosted zone inside the VPC, Route 53 in that case is in the region. So if you are doing DNS resolution inside the outpost, inside the VPC, that will not function as well whilst that connection is dropped. Um, but you could access the instances directly via the IP as long as your IAM credentials haven't failed. And, and generally what we've seen is that your IAM, sorry, your IAM credentials would expire. And what we've seen is that happens uh, between about four or six hours, depending um, from when, when you lose that connectivity. So again, redundant connectivity is super important. Um, we're also investigating things like, could we have an outpost that is on a cruise ship sent up to Alaska or not? Like, is that possible from an engineering perspective? And right now, it's not, uh, but who knows what happens in the future. Oh, yeah, like I said, uh, we'll quote this. We'll come back to this and be like, hey, uh, Matt yeah. said a cruise ship are going on there. <laughs> <laughs> Watch, I'm going to have a whole bunch of different companies that want to put out posts on, on ships and planes and all sorts of stuff, reach out now and, and want to have this. But that's fine. I mean, um, what I will say is um, a lot of our features, if not all of our features, uh, I won't say all, but most are from customer feedback. Yep. So if we get customers that ask for a particular thing and we get a lot of them that want this particular thing, we will build that capability if it's um, you know possible from an engineering perspective. Right. So um, always love feedback, always love chatting to people and figuring out what ideas they have on how they want to use these things. Yeah, that's actually a good point is that we take a lot of this feedback and we build it as long as it has a great customer experience for the customer, uh, we will try to build it. We'll try to, you know, that's what the customer needs and what is looking for. Um, so I don't have any more questions because I wanted to make this uh, really easily consumable and, you know, informative for everybody. My last thing that I'm gonna show on the screen, if, you ha if you're interested in more information, uh, you wanna learn more about Outpost here, what I'm gonna bring on the screen here is uh, right here. Here is our outpost URL for it, you know, AWS, amazon.com slash outpost. Uh, you can get started. There's the features, the pricing. You'll also notice that, uh, you know, the recent release of, uh, you know, the RDS one that came out that Matt stole from me um, it is in here and it's pretty cool. And in fact, you'll, you'll notice in my Twitter feed that I do actually have that out there that will have you know, all the recent release, I try to pick the good ones that I'm interested in and that everybody's giving me great feedback and obviously Outpost with RDS for uh, MySQL and Postgres, uh, you know, was really awesome. Uh, that's all I have in there. Matt, is, is there anything else you'd like to add before we close it out? No, I think, um, I mean, we covered a whole bunch of stuff. Um, there's a bit of content out there and, and we're, we're growing our, our public content around Outpost as well. I think. Um, we tried to build it so it was as familiar as possible, you know, by using VPC and you can use Direct Connect. Um, so hopefully there's not too much of a, you know, a technical gap between using an outpost and, and the region. Um, but yeah, I'm super excited about the future of this product and, you know, I'm, I'm fully on board and um, I, I worked in other areas of, of Amazon working on EC2 networking and, and working on, you know, other things and I'm now actually trying to dedicate a lot of my time to Outpost because I really believe in this product and I'm super excited by it. So um, I'm also super excited to hear what folks want to do with this thing as well. So it's very cool. But yeah, thanks for, for having me on here, John. Really, really nice chatting with you today. It was lots of fun. Yeah, so Matt, I'm gonna leave everybody with a thing. Uh, I really like the Outpost feature being that I love AWS and I come from a traditional data center background and since they married the two together there, it just resonates and sits with me, uh, you know, and having that availability of going into the console and just deploying something on an outpost and not really thinking about it, knowing that it's on there and, you know, that you're utilizing that service is pretty cool. So, Matt, I got to thank you again for your time, for jumping on here, uh, answering my questions. You've always been readily available to me. Uh, you know, picking your brain, not only for your know, outpost, but for the user guide, I, I, I picked your brain plenty of times with that one. And, uh, as, you know, as I take those exams, I want to ask why the question was a certain way. Uh, you've educated me on that. So <laughs> yeah, I won't call you out on it. There's some tough just... ones in that exam, right? What's there, that? There, there's some, I've heard that's one of the toughest exams. 
um, the, the networking specialty. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely a challenge on that one, but it gets you to think and I really like it. I just, I feel so challenged with it. Uh, so I had to pick your brain with some of the questions that came up. So once again, Matt, thank you so much. Thank you for your time. I uh, really appreciate it, everybody. Uh, I'll have this posted as, uh, as soon as possible. And if you have any questions, feel free to comment on the videos and I'll try to get them back to Matt in a respectable time. Thanks, Matt. Sounds good. Thanks, Sean.